Britt here. Um, welcome to this evening's presentation. Um, my name is Christopher Case. I'm the co-deputy director of the East Central European Center here at uh, the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. Um, welcome to an event which is co-sponsored with the Institute of Polish Culture here in New York. And um, we are fortunate to have with us tonight Ms. Krystyna uh, Piłkowska, um, who is one of our own alumna, who holds an MFA from Columbia University and who worked for many years as a translator. Um, and it was in her capacity as a translator for the Museum of the Polish Army that she um, arrived at a unique hole in the historical record um, about the events of Katyn, um, specifically the documentation, uh, the excellent documentation about the knowledge of the event in English language circles, intelligence circles, military circles, political circles. And so it's on the occasion of the uh, massacre in Katyn, which occurred uh, 83 years ago uh, this year, um, and this is the 80th anniversary of the um, exhumations and the documentation and the news uh, about the event in the world press from 1943, which we are thinking about tonight. So uh, uh, among the many copying uh, commemorative events which are occurring doubtless around the world in the US and in Poland, and even in copying in Russia, um, although under changed circumstances, we're happy to have Ms. Kristina Pirkowska here. Um, and uh, among the vast uh, amount of material surrounding this event, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's origins, it's, um, uh, it's um, occurrence, it's consequences. Uh, Ms. Kristina Pirkowska has essentially um, invented, created, established herself as the foremost authority on the English language knowledge of the event that was available to um, uh, politicians, intelligence agents, um, um, advisors, consultants, and potentially also um, uh, average people who happen to be in contact with some of the English language witnesses. Um, so we're very happy to uh, welcome Ms. Kutsina Kutkowska. Um, I turn it over to you. Uh, our lecture will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers um, about Ms. Kutkowska's research. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, as we're going along, I'm hopefully going to manage to keep up with my time slides. And there will be various subjects there that I may not touch upon directly in my presentation, but there will be themes that you may want to pick up on later. So. As was mentioned, we're essentially observing the 80th anniversary because it was on uh, the 11th of uh, April that the German government announced, and then on the 13th of April that Radio Berlin made a uh, radio announcement of the discovery of graves at a place in Russia outside of the city of Smolensk. And we'll be dealing with a number of issues. Why was Katyn disclosed, or the massacre of Katyn disclosed at that time? Uh, why was it called Katyn? It didn't actually occur in Katyn or near to Katyn. It was much closer to a place called Gniezdovo. And when did the Germans actually find out about Katyn? So, as you can see, uh, there were Polish uh, delegates who came in prior to the announcement actually being made. They flew out on the 10th of April and were in uh, Katyn on the 10th and 11th. And you'll see two photographs in a few moments. They will be important when you see some photographs later on of when the English speaking witnesses arrived in Katyn, how the Germans had refined their documentary quote unquote process, i.e. photographing and filming them. In, these initial, uh, in this initial visit on the film, you can see photographers running around in front of the camera. The cameras aren't hidden. Uh, the uh, camera angles change, so clearly the cameramen are moving around. Uh, how they did it with that equipment, that's such a good question, but that's what they did. Uh, we might get to speaking somewhat about the Budenko Commission. I would like to talk to you about the role of 
while Bill Donovan and the OSS in advising uh, the U.S. prosecutors at the Nuremberg Tribunal about what, or rather, what not to do with the company in charge, and also the preparations of the Madden Committee for their hearings in 1951-52. And here I would simply add that the hearings started in 1951 and there was only one hearing held in 1951 in October. That was because one of the witnesses was going to be sent into the Pacific uh, area, and so they needed to do it then. So where are we in 1943? We have a war in which there uh, have been victories, quote unquote, uh, by the Germans uh, in Stalingrad. Um, but the Germans also withdrew from Africa. Uh, for the United States, the battles for the Solomon Islands had ended. But Leningrad was still under siege. Uh, Japan controlled most of Southeast Asia, or all of it, and Germany controlled Eastern Mediterranean and the Greek islands. And yet, the Western allies had already begun thinking about bringing the Germans to justice and how that process would work. So back to Kapting. Gerstorf, who later was a general and who in fact uh, was in the groups that opposed Hitler, was in charge of intelligence for Army Armite, Middle Army, uh, and that was, was located near Smolensk. He informs Berlin in February of the existence of these graves. And the Polish representatives who are brought there by the Germans, and it's pretty certain that the Germans were aware of them, they're aware of this fact, came there with the knowledge and approval of the underground. So it wasn't a collaborationist act. They were coming there to find out what was happening. And so this is one of the images that I'm showing you where you can see on the right, it's poor quality, but it's a shot from one of the films that was recorded at that time in, um, in Kapping. Um, Bergstorff testifies about, to the Madden Committee when they were in Germany, about why it was called Kapping. Because Gniezdovo was a site with Kurhani, and they had been uh, doing ex archaeological excavations there. And the one thing they did not want was for the Soviets to be able to say, oh, they're just digging up old 4,000 year old bodies and uh, this has nothing to do with any massacre. So what, what, what are they talking about? So he's advised them. Um, by the 17th of April, the Polish Red Cross approaches what is always referred to as the International Red Cross, but it is not. It is the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. And uh, they ask them to send a team to Katyn. They tell them we can't do it unless Russia agrees. Um, that same day, April 17th, so things are moving very quickly. The announcement was just made on the 10th. You can see that the graves are pretty well dug up. You could also see snow in the surrounding area. But that same day, Polish POWs arrive. They're brought in and there. Uh, severance of diplomatic relations. Um, and I'm not going back and starting with the basics because I was told that you all would know all the basics. Stalin did this very elegantly. To use that word speaking about him. Uh, Easter, Latin Rite, and Eastern Rite was that same Sunday. And he had all the churches open. So filmographers, Reuters was there filming, Metropolitan Nikolai, who later is part of the Burdenko Commission, or actually is part of it already by, before then, it, but a section called the Burdenko was not yet developed. And that news hit the press, the media, in the United States on Sunday. Saturday night, Paschal Mass, Sunday, it's in the American media. Sunday to Monday, diplomatic relations are severed with Poland. That news doesn't hit until Tuesday, Wednesday. It's the third page, if you're lucky. It's not a front page story. And so it totally passes 
under the radar. Um, but here is the quote from the Madden Committee hearing uh, where General von Gerstoff is discussing why we did not call it the murderers because okay, I already told you that. So now he says um, there were a great number of German delegations, commissions of American, British, French, and political prisoners of war. I've never found a trace of a French prisoner of war. Um, there is talk of the Canadians, and I presume that that fits under the category of British, which would be British and Dominion. We know there were New Zealanders there. We've been at, they, they were identified. Um, they, the Polish officers, I have not seen any information or a record of them ever filing a protest with the Swiss protecting powers, the puissance protectrice, which the British did. There is no record of them filing an official protest with the camp commandants of the offlogs where they were uh, where they were held. And that surprised me because we'll talk about that in a moment. So the International Medical Commission was formed uh, by the Germans upon the suggestion of the International Committee of the Red Cross, which said, look, we can't send anybody, but you have guys who are knowledgeable forensic scientists, the creators of that deal, and why don't you invite them to come in? And all of them basically came from countries that were either occupied by Germany with one exception, and that is, of course, Dr. Navil from Switzerland. And there was one American citizen among them, but he was a Croatian. He was born in the U.S., returned to Croatia with his parents, finished medical school there, studied in Vienna, and so on and so forth. Uh, among them also was Dr. Orsos, Ferenc Orsos. He's like the progenitor of forensic science. Uh, Miloslavich became the progenitor of CSI in the United States when he uh, returned after the war. They were in Katyn the 28th, the 29th, and by the 30th, they were in Bialystok. That document was printed in three languages in Bialystok, and I find it amazing that during the wartime they were able to reproduce in Bialystok their signatures and print the whole document up. So, who are the English-speaking witnesses to Katyn? There were originally four officers, one civilian and seven non-cops, a total of 12 people. Um, Colonel Stevenson was not a regular army officer. He was a reserve officer. He was from South Africa. He had served in World War I. Uh, two Americans, West Point, uh, Captain Dr. Gilder, a Scotsman, who was one of the territorials. Frank Strubert, a civilian internee who is described in the Madden Committee hearings, stenotypist didn't hear it clearly, uh, as an attorney. No, he was an internee. And Corporal Sutty from New Zealand is one of the people that was identified. And he served as what is the British referred to as a Batman or an orderly for the officers when they were in Berlin. So the British actually were pretty organized. I got to give them credit. They, first of all, had a system for sending out coded letters. They taught the Americans about that. They knew the total procedures and conventions of what you have to do. So there was a protest to the camp commandant. Uh, written protest goes to the puissance protectrice. They demand written orders from the camp commandant. And then they submit, uh, Major Nicholson submits in the name of Stevenson, Stewart, and Van Vliet a written protest that they are going to cutting under duress. They, there was discretion on the issue of coded letters, of radios. They had radios. They had radios in the in Rothweil, which was a hospital where Dr. Gilder worked. And they had radios in Oflak 9AZ. And when the Americans were taken from Rothenburg of Block 9AZ to Poland to Schubin of Block 64, they literally carried out saws and radios in their knapsacks and stuff like that. 
But there's a difference between what uh, Van Vliet testifies to and what he put in his report. In his testimony, he's much more circuitous. While in the written report, he was direct and clear that we heard about the German announcements on the radio, i.e. the radios that they had in the camp. So this is the road uh, that they took just very quickly. Uh, so this is Oplag 9AZ. Uh, this is uh, Oplag uh, 4, which is where Gilder worked, uh, Rochville. And this is uh, Laufen, an ELOC, where the civilian internees were held. Hop, skip, you sneeze hard, and you're in Salzburg. They're all brought to Berlin. And this is around the 8th, 9th of May. And in Berlin, they're questioned. And then they fly the plane lands in Breslau or Wrocław in Biała Podlaska, where they celebrate eating real eggs and gone to Katyn. They were lodged in an Arbats house, which Frank Strubin describes the route there. And you can literally still locate it by walking from the main railroad station or the location where it was. Um, the officers were kept separately. So the civilian and the non-coms clearly wouldn't have such a great knowledge of how to behave under these circumstances. And that goes back to that code of conduct of wanting to behave uh, appropriately as an officer. And they don't know Dr. Gilder, but as a physician working in the hospitals, he's had Russian prisoners he, who were patients, he's had the Germans. So he's learned some of German and some Russian, and they don't want to trust him. It takes a while for that to break through. The same way with Strubit. He decides to wear a suit and gets a tie from somebody, and he wants to look proper. He wasn't educated. He really felt that. And they was like, why is this guy so dressed up if he's a prisoner? Um, and so that's the New Zealander was their Batman, and presumably he passed on the explanation and the orders to the rest. Each of the 12 was interviewed separately. Well, we believe it was Lord Howe How, who uh, was the one who was interviewing them. And each refused to cooperate. The last one to be interviewed was Stevenson. Stevenson, who did like to aggrandize himself, becomes senior officer. I believe Van Vliet stepped back, allowed him to do that, so that he could be in an easier position to observe and note things rather than be this point of attention. And so Stevenson is asked to sign a parole. He refuses to do this. And at that point, the Germans say, well, you're not signing the parole. You may try to escape. Therefore, we're sending the four Americans back and we're replacing them with four armed guards. Right. Like, we're flying into the midst of the Eastern Front, and we're going to escape in the Eastern Front. Brilliant. Okay. So, very quickly, Van Vliet, most of the time, if you see a photograph of him in Katyn, it's his back. Struben, the civilian. Dr. Boots, the German, not very clean hand, but, but he is a forensic scientist. Dr. Gilder, who at this point, he's doing the communicating. He can talk medical language. He can talk German, speak German. Uh, Struben, Stewart. These are two of the non-coms, and there's the tip of the hat of the other non-com. Which one of them is Suddy? I don't know. I've never seen a photograph of Suddy. Um, so when they arrive in Kaping, uh, they kind of make that decision that they're going to let Gilder do the communicating for, for them. And Dr. Wojcinski will. This is another famous photograph. This is one of the few photographs where you see Van Vliet's face. And of course, you notice Stevenson has positioned himself right in the center of that photograph. Um, and Dr. Gilder is speaking with Kiselev, and that's Strubent. And he's asking Kiselev, uh, how much did they pay you to tell us this? And he's speaking to him in Russian. Um, what also happened was the Poles had wanted to have their own people there working at the site. And so very quickly, in one of the first slides, one of the first days, they sent 
a technical commission from the Polish Red Cross, which actually conducted the autopsies and corrected and made sure that names were recorded properly. And let me do this and then I'll be right back. Um, so clearly a message came out of Rotenberg in May of 43. Right as they're on their way to Berlin, the message comes and the British MI9 gets it. And then with some delay passes it on because they were supposedly sharing everything right away with the Americans. To the Americans, there's a whole list of the bottom of who they shared it with. But there is no mention that there are US officers. There is a mention of other ranks. So clearly, at least by middle end of June, the Americans knew because the message from the Puissance Project Trees took some time to get there. This is a letter or a memorandum or demarche sent in by the ambassador in Stockholm, Herschel Johnson, who met one of the Swedes who had been part of the International Medical Commission. And so he reports about what his conversation was like over dinner, what they discussed about the Kapi massacre and so on and so forth. These are not the documents that you've normally heard of about General Strong getting a report from Colonel Shemaisky, or this one collecting that, or that one collecting. This is, I mean, this is in-house. This is State Department reporting to State Department. The other one was MI9 reporting to uh, G2, the American MISX unit. So, I mentioned earlier, the British were organized. They knew how to use codes. Americans did not start MISX until 1942. People who left out earlier, they, did, they had to learn the codes from the British. When those letters came in, the old box 1142, uh, the letters sent by people whose names were on that list were immediately separated out. The rest of the mail went to the families. These letters were very carefully opened, copy, literally photocopy, photography, and then decoded. Um, typo, I didn't see it, sorry. Uh, in uh, Colonel Stevenson was freed on compassionate release. The British have not, I found his report in South Africa in the military archives in an unmarked, unnumbered, unregistered folder. Uh, but he was released on compassionate leave, release. He was sent to Britain and very high level people interviewed him aside from MI9. That report that he wrote at that time has never been admitted to or acknowledged by the British government. Uh, when my book was published in Poland, the Brits were invited to the opening uh, or the publication release, uh, and they did not attend. Uh, Captain Gilder left somewhat earlier. His report has never been really discussed by the British government. So this is his report, he was very quickly, uh, Stevenson sent out from Britain. Presumably they were trying to keep him from either having contact with the media or whatever. And so he gets travel papers. He's out within three weeks. This is uh, amazing. Other people were held for two and three months when they were released from uh, Oplux, excuse me. And he goes off to South Africa where he was living and does his thing. When they returned, and I know I'm bouncing around a bit, but I think you can follow it. When they returned from Kaping, so they were there basically the 12th and the 13th, because they had heard about the fall of Tunis while they were in Kaping. Um, they come to Berlin. The non comms, the three guys are sent immediately back to the soldat. Strubent is sent back to Laufen. He never discusses. They made that agreement. They were not going to discuss it with their fellow internees. They made it clear that they would never speak to media. 
And uh, he was custodian of a radio that they had there. And he recorded every night sitting there with a 10 watt bulb, what he heard, all the news that was coming through. Um, my belief is that the Forbidden Whisper was also a short burst, burst radio. And he was very fond of it. He brought it back with him from the camp in his luggage. And he was not allowed to return to Guernsey for about three months. And he couldn't publish his book for over 20 years. So the OSS, while Bill Donovan, it's our precursor of our CIA, and they're doing an analysis of what's going to happen. How are we going to handle our victory? What are we going to do? with the Germans. What's interesting is that actually the Germans were the first ones in World War II to have created a unit that was investigating atrocities and battles and was going to bring the perpetrators of atrocities to trial. And that in part led to what they were doing at Tuffin. And in very quick summary, Poland approaches the allies, meaning, um, France and Great Britain at that time, and tells them something has to be done about what's happening in Poland. Um, in, on December 7th, 1942, it's referred to as the St. James paper. They submit a white paper. It's talking about the extermination of the Jews in occupied Poland. Um, it's Nothing happens for two years, but suddenly after 10 days, there's suddenly a first agreement. And this proceeds then onwards. The Gordenko Commission was not a freestanding commission. It was part of an extraordinary state commission, yada, yada, yada. They like long names. There were, as you can see, 32 subcommissions. And I found it most humorous that one of them dealt purely with the destruction of religious objects in the Soviet Union by the fascists, uh, as though the Russians hadn't been destroying uh, religious objects uh, all along. So the series of meetings occurred and discussions over how the charges were going to be prepared for the tribunals and the trials. And it was at that final meeting that the Russians stated that they were going to bring up a charge of cutting and charge the Germans with that massacre. Um, the agreement also said that had been agreed, that had been made that the country that controlled the area where the crime had been perpetrated. So it's either in your own country, for example, i.e. on the territory of Russia or the Soviet Union, or they could also see on the territory of the Baltic nations or Poland, then Russia would be the prosecutor and conduct the trial. So in accordance with that, that became the mm, responsibility of the prosecutor from the Soviet Union to bring up the charges against the Germans. And while Bill Donovan advised Justice Jackson in a series of documents that were classified secret and only became available about six years ago, uh, that this could lead uh, to a failure for the entire prosecutor, prosecutorial case. But by we only got those documents because Donovan never returned them. Uh, he kept them and uh, left them in his law firm. And when they were either liquidating the law firm or downsizing it, somebody located them. So, Justice Jackson, I do not have much sympathy for the gentleman. Um, he was purely analytical. And as you can see, evidence must be documentary, papers and documents located in German archives. There are no documents available, therefore, um, that, there no, that we couldn't prove that the Russians uh, committed the Katyn massacre. He also forgot to mention that he had gotten this memo from Donovan with 
uh, reports written up by two people who were very knowledgeable on the process of, of what had occurred and who advised them that it, you know, that the, that the Germans could not be charged with this. In his folders in the Library of Congress, um, you can find the memo from General Clay. Sorry, I didn't type in Polish, obviously. Um, dated January 21st of 1946, and a document uh, signed by a number of members of the Polish parliament in exile, uh, asking that the Katyn massacre not be brought up in Nuremberg. Um, they were very concerned that if it was brought up and the Germans weren't found guilty of it, or were rather found guilty. In either case, the options, one was bad and the other was worse. It was, there was no good option if that was brought up in Nuremberg. I believe that Jackson knew that the English speaking witnesses had been there. And uh, as I said, the analysis of the charges were prepared by Schlaberndorf. And uh, there was a translation which was commented by on by Pathy and the cover memo from Donovan, which discussed why you can't bring this up. I believe that um, Jackson had that. Jackson also received a copy of a book that was published in London. And nobody's ever really said, well, why did the Poles publish this book? The Massacre of the Polish Officers in the Cuffing Woods. Why was it published in 1946? And nobody knows if it was published by the government, but it says for private circulation only, and it was privately published. Uh, my belief was, is that the Polish government, with Matskiewicz also helping to work on this, prepared this, and they did send it to Jackson. He claims he never received it. Um, in order to introduce the facts about copying to the American and British prosecutors, so that they would have as much documentary evidentiary material as was available at that time in order to know how to deal with the charges which were being pressed against uh, the Germans. Um, so the OSS was in fact the investigational body for US prosecutors in Nuremberg. Uh, we kind of think of the OSS just dying a natural death in 46. It really didn't. It, it continued on somewhat longer because obviously the trials continued on until 48. Um, the 48 trial, which was the Wehrmacht trial, involved uh, a memorandum which came out of Frankfurt and went out through Germany and Austria and required that investigations be conducted on the subject of cutting and not just anybody because everybody knows about cutting, but people who have specific and detailed knowledge about cutting. And uh, that memorandum, I could, again, 240 pages of documentation, interviews and reports, and nobody really knows why. The primary ones were conducted by the Counterintelligence Corps, Seventh and Eighth Corps in Austria. And again, I believe that this was prepared for the Wehrmacht trials. Nobody's talked about it, but that's the only logical conclusion. That material was part of what was uh, released in 2012 at the request of Marcy Capture. Uh, the US government went in and checked their archives and retrieved a lot of information. So these are all the men who were working with the OSS, advising Jonathan, um, helping the prosecutors. Klemperer, whose photograph will appear in a minute, uh, was in fact working for Jackson. There's one man whose photograph I couldn't find anywhere. And after the war, he actually worked in Persia for the Shah. So uh, going deep underground. Um, 
And of course, Rako Lemkin is there. And at night, when the prosecutors finished their day's work, Lemkin would be meeting with them to talk to them and explain and discuss and teach them about the concept of genocide and related subjects. So I kind of think that all of those officers who were in the prosecutorial team, because most of the support staff were Army, got a, a major education at that time. But this is 1946, and we should sort of move back to 1944, 1945. Um, as I said, when they came back from Berlin, they were sent off to the non-coms to their uh, Soldag. Strubent went to Laufen. Dr. Gilder went back to Rockwell to the hospital. And I think that one of the New Zealanders came with him from the hospital. And so we have three men who are still left in Berlin. But no, it's actually only two. Because Stevenson has at this point said, I want to write a book about this. I want to publicize this. This is the worst crime I've ever seen in my life, and so on. And he gets sent off to a camp near Bologna and essentially disappears for three months. We don't know where he, what he was doing that during that period. There are no reports. He then comes back and is sent to another regular off log and uh, basically stays quietly there until he's released on compassionate release. Van Vliet and Stewart, someplace around the 20th, May the 25th of May, are sent back to Rottenburg on Fulda to offload 9AZ. And the Americans are packing up. They're going to be shipped to offload 64 and Shulgi. But the Brits are preparing an escape. This is the first time that Van Vliet wants to escape. And he's not escaping because he wants to escape. He's escaping because he wants to spread the information, the knowledge that he has about Kati. The Germans had given them photographs, those photographs that you saw, there were the two of them, and then there were other ones. Uh, he was able to take notes when he went to the little building that was used sort of as a repository of documents. And he sort of fumbles and says he sprained his ankles, so they can't really ship them off to Shubin. And at that point in time, uh, the rest of the group goes off to Shubin, and they're about to escape, and suddenly the Germans capture them. So, end of story, no escape. He gets shipped off to Shubin, where he's the person in charge of all escape plans. So, to understand the structure of an off log, you would have the senior officer in the camp, who would be in charge and who would meet with the German camp commandant, and you'd have a whole structure under him. There would be the deputy under him who was the person who knew about the second parallel and secret structure. The people who knew about the coded letters, who were the registered code users, the people who were in charge of the escape committee, and Van Vliet was in charge of the escape committee. And Van Vliet is sending information out about what he um, saw, what he and Stewart and the others saw in Kapi. In the spring of 44, he sends a letter to his girlfriend in P.O. Box 1142, who turns out to be a cigar chomping colonel, and wants to plan an escape from Shubin. And when I first went to Shubin, it was still there. There's a plateau right over the area where the camp is located. And it was totally open at the time. And planes could have landed there. And they dug a tunnel, which went out only about 50 feet from the camp, but on the other side of a road in a little forest. And then they would have had to have made it up the hill. And he sent out the request at the start of 44. And unfortunately, people had other things on their mind. 
And then by the time they came along to looking at this in Britain and the early part of May, they said, well, gee, we have a bigger project on hand. So uh, your project to escape falls away. Um, <clears throat> so Van Vliet is scared, concerned, worried that he and Stuart can be eliminated for having seen Kathing if the German, if the Russians come in and occupy this camp. Um, he's also concerned that since they're officers, hell, maybe these Soviets are going to come along and slaughter these Americans as well. He, can't, he wasn't willing to count on the fact that they weren't going to do it. And the Germans marched them out at the end of January of 45. And they go up to Ustom, that area, and they go across. There's a train there. Uh, coming up still on the island from the German side, and they split the group in two. And I believe that Van Vliet planned this. Uh, the healthy men march out, Stuart goes with that group, and Van Vliet, together with a Dutchman, who was an interpreter when had dressed himself in a U.S. uniform and claimed to be a U.S. citizen because he knew he would get shot by the Germans when they were captured otherwise, um, they're assigned to the group of sick and infirm men, and this train takes them in to Luckenwald. Now, we're at the British Madden Committee. The Madden Committee met with representatives of the British Embassy in Washington before they went. And they said, we want to meet with Struben, Stevenson. Gilger, they had the names. The embassy informed the foreign office. And so the British foreign office figured out a way of, I won't use nasty words, but of making it impossible for uh, the Madden Committee, which was investigating the Katyn massacre, to meet with them. Um, the letters that you saw there were written to Frank's own, I only found the letters to Stevenson, the British don't admit to the existence of any others. Uh, they were written on April 15th, addressed to Frank Stevenson, address unknown. And then you see another letter which is sent at the end of May by the British War Department representative to the military attache at South Africa House saying, oh, well, the Americans have left. They've been gone for three weeks. Uh, you can send the letter on to, to Stevenson if you want. And, and he did. He did. And Stevenson immediately responds. Now, here is a list of the doctors who are part of the International Medical Commission. There's Dr. Orsos, Dr. Saxon, Dr. Tromsen, and Dr. Piga. Tromsen and Piga are quite interesting. Piga was an elderly Spaniard. He <laughs> arrived in Berlin and whoop, turned right around and flew out after making his official required visit to the Spanish embassy in Berlin. In 1952, when they were prepping for the Madden Committee to come to Europe and meet with witnesses and interview them, US officials went to meet with Dr. Piga and said, uh, well, can we talk about it? How is it that you ended up not going to Katyn? And he said, well, don't, don't you know? And then proceeds to tell them what their predecessors never told them was that there had been pressure put on the Spanish Foreign Office by the United States to not allow Piga to go to Katyn. And that's why he had to return immediately from Berlin. And um, and so he never testified in front of the Madden Committee. That wouldn't be um, good. Now, um, most of you have probably heard about the missing Van Vliet report and the accusation that General Bissell, who was the head of G2, destroyed it. Bissell did not destroy it. I am willing to bank my credit cards and bank accounts on it. Um, what happened, and what's also interesting to me, is that 
in the very scarce, scarce and sparse working papers of the Madden Committee, you will see his questions in writing about what's going to happen. And he's told by the Army representatives, don't worry about the questions. 10th of May, 1945. Van Vliet is in Paris. He's made it out of Luchenwald, Leipzig, and now he's in Paris waiting to get out. And the U.S., the JAG, U.S. War Crimes Unit in Paris meets with him at Shape headquarters, and he makes a sworn deposition, signed in four copies, and somehow the War Crimes Unit deposition disappears. Um, nobody knows where it is. I found the shafe one in a crazy file in Maryland in November of 2014. The two copies returned with Van Vliet to Washington. That was when he went to see Bissell, waited for Bissell, who was on the West Coast because the Japanese were sending over helium bombs and he was trying to quiet the media because people were being killed and they didn't want total panic. And it is my firm belief that the report of May 22nd, 1945, that Van Vliet prepared, referred to and had attached to it, not only the photographs that Van Vliet mentions in his testimony that, you know, these photographs were attached to the original reports, but I don't have them, but also included a copy or to the copies of the Schaefer report. So if we want to talk about a code of conduct, which is painful in this case, um, oh, yes. Who really worked on preparing, the, laying the groundwork for the Madden Committee? Two men, Mitchell, not that Mitchell, he was the attorney of the counsel for the Madden Committee, and Ambassador Bliss Lane, who was no longer ambassador, and took two trips, the grand tour. His wife was off to supposedly buy dresses, and he was meeting with people along the way and picking up things. And what did he get from Dr. Tramson? He got from Tramson a piece of rope that Tramson had brought out from Cutting. And in his files, uh, you will find a letter signed by J. Edgar after the FBI tested the rope and said it was not of German, French, British, American, or any known production. So they were trying to eliminate where that rope, and this is, of course, the rope that tied the hands back. In the Madden Committee hearings, um, uh, Gerstorf talks about the rope, and Mr. Dondero says, you might be interested to know that the record already shows that a part of that crow court has been presented to this committee and received in evidence. It was flat. This is before Transcend testifies. So they already knew somehow, and Bliss Lane must have given it, that's missing from the working files or the records of the Madden Committee. And Dr. Thompson yeah. talks about it saying, what, you know, did you make a personal examination, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, I examined one of them very closely and brought one back to me, with me to Denmark. And I have previously, uh, about a year ago, put it at the disposal of the committee by Mr. Arthur Bliss Lane, who took it with him to the United States. And then Mitchell, who's the attorney, says, I would like to have the record show that Mr. Arthur Bliss Lane has offered this rope to the committee. Second confirmation that they've got the rope. We never hear any discussion about it afterwards. It's it's one of the mysteries of uh, what happened really with the Madden Code. So, talking about the Code of Ethics, they, they were aware they were going to be used as tools. They were supposed to be the little puppets who went out, who actually saw massacre and saw documentary proof that it was the Russians. And it wasn't based on the statements of the Germans, it was based on the condition of the clothing and the condition of the shoes that the men were wearing. Um, they accepted a unified position and stated they would not speak to German media. They thought what was gonna happen was they'd be thrown over the border to Spain or to Portugal. And then that would be a different kettle of fish they could talk. Um, none of them 
ever disclosed the existence of coded letters, of uh, the short burst radios, or many other things. It was only in his last interview as one of the last living men uh, that um, John Van Vliet spoke in an oral video history about the fact that he was a registered code user. He never talked about the statement in Paris. The British government has never conducted a review like the United States government did. And lamentably, the Polish government, despite my screaming about it for the past 10 years, has never requested the British to open up their records. Hansel Park, MI9, and other British archives contain information necessary to fuller understanding of what had happened. And I think I almost made it. Well, <laughs> probably missed things, but <laughs> almost made it. I hope. Thank you so much for a very fascinating presentation. Um, we have about uh, 40 minutes for questions and answers um, here. Um, I'm sure there are uh, plenty of questions from our audience. We may have some online as well. But I wonder if I might just start with a quick question. Yes, please, please go ahead. Um, uh, and my question is about the um, continued as you mentioned, obfuscation of the event on the part of British uh, officials, even into the 1950s. And now, clearly in the 1940s. The, no, it's 2023. 2020, okay, yeah. So that is my 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 question is, um, clearly in the 40s, there was a, um, um, a pragmatic a, reason, pragmatic reason not to, uh, you know, alienate the, uh, you know, the Soviet Union had an ally needed in the war effort. Um, but beyond that, into the 50s, the Madden Commission, the, the British refusal to, um, you know, release information, is this, what is the, what's your theory about city origin and continued obfuscation? Is it simply to cover the fact that earlier they had made a pragmatic decision, so it's no longer about the Soviet Union, but about their own history? Is that primarily what we're... What we're uh, uh, that's my reasoning. My reasoning, yeah. all, that also applies to the disappearance of the Van Vliet report. Okay. My reasoning is the following. 1949, Julius Epstein publishes two articles on July 4th weekend uh, in the Herald Tribune. Or was it still just the Tribune? And uh, pretty lengthy articles on the subject of cutting. And uh, then a guy who's a professor in New Hampshire writes to him and says, oh, I know two guys who went there and these are their names and yada, yada. And so this little rock starts rolling. Most documents that they prepared at that time were prepared in literally up to nine copies. I think if you were typing on a manual typewriter, you had to be <laughs> to, get, to get through uh, the carbons. Um, I find it very difficult to believe that the Van Vliet report totally disappeared. I believe that what may have happened is in fact, when they in 1952, in the midst of um, the issue with Korea, with the statements that Korean, North Koreans are massacring American soldiers in a similar way to cutting and so on, pulling out that report, seeing the attached sworn deposition, it was like, Oh my God, the question is going to be, why was this not discussed in Nuremberg? Why does this not present it at the tribunal? Why were the Russians, the Soviets allowed to do as much as they did when we had all this documentary evidence? And so somebody probably in the heat of the moment made a decision to, okay, okay it doesn't exist. Shred it, get rid of it. <laughs> Cover the paper trail, I suppose. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was my question. Okay. Um, let me open it up to you folks here. Um, are there any questions in the audience for? Um, or have I answered all of your I questions the answer, yes. forever and ever? The answer, yes. The thing is, ever learned how the POWs were able to use a code under the eyes of the Nazis and get this information out of the POW camps into American hands? Um, the, the code is a very simple code. I actually saw a letter 
in the archives and, and realized, oh my God, it's a coded letter. Uh, and, and you could break it. There was a methodology to how it was structured. It was not a letter code. It was more of a word and you had to know which line, which number word and so on. But you, it could be figured out. For some reason, they must have thought the Americans and were adults and the British as well and didn't give them enough credit to have the writing. Van Vliet actually wrote and requested that a handgun be sent in, and they managed to get a handgun smuggled in to the, to the offlog. And your question is, how did they get a handgun smuggled in if all packages were being opened? Well, at the appropriate moment, when they knew that that package would be coming out, because the guys were, of course, unloading, the POWs were unloading the truck, uh, they said to the German guards who were supposed to be checking, oh, you want some coffee and some cigarettes? We have some fresh coffee and cigarettes. And yeah. Who wouldn't want real coffee instead of ersatz? And as he turns his back, suddenly this package ends up in the pile of the package that packages that have been controlled, and they had a handgun. Weirder things than just getting a coded letter out, out happened. Yeah, the, the massive appetite of Germans during the war for bribes of all sorts. You know, not not very well known in Poland as well. Yes, my question. Yes, question right here. Your um, detective work is that yes, I know. How, how you're able to connect all of that um, means for the detective on very, very uh, impressive with that. Would you be able to edify me briefly uh, about uh, Marcy Capture's role in the inquiry that leads them to investigations? I'm not, I'm that part I'm not familiar with. Uh, Some place around 2010, um, Marcy Capture uh, requested from President Obama, presented the subject of cutting, and requested of him that the National Archives and all relevant archives go through their materials and determine what relates to cutting and if it can be declassified to declassify it. Uh, for example, the letters that I found had actually been declassified way back earlier when I started writing about them, although I never printed uh, in a presentation or anywhere else a copy of that letter, but since we talked about the coded letters, um, it was reclassified. <laughs> so, which, which really amazed me. I, I was to you speaking to an Air Force colonel one day mm -hmm. and I said, I don't understand. Why don't you guys want to talk about coded letters? And he said, I said, do you probably have buttons today and you press them and it sends out a signal. And it knows it's John Jones and what his coordinates are. And he said, and finally, the only thing he would say to me was, um, do you remember when we bombed Hanoi? And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, do you remember why we bombed Hanoi? I said, oh, yes, the POW who sat there fluttering his eyes and in Morse code gave out a message. And he said, well, yes, that's why we won't discuss coded letters. Like, okay. But yes, she requested that. That was probably around 2010. By around 2012, August, that's when those documents were released. Is it all of them? I would never say it's all of them. Just like I found the um, sworn deposition that had been declassified in 78 or something. But it was in a box of papers relating to airmen who crash landed in Belgium and France. And how it ended up there, I don't know. But it related to POWs, and I had asked for the files, and it was basically those two table lengths full of boxes. And I just sat there going through every single one. So does that answer? The old old the, was there a certain constituency group in Ohio that might have petitioned her I, to do that? I've um, not heard of that, but I am presuming that it was. Well. No, no, she I believe it was people. Yes, that, yes. Yeah. But she's certainly part of the uh, Polish uh, subcommittee and the Ukrainian subcommittee in the Congress. Caucus, yeah, the caucuses. Right. Sorry for that. Very good. I answered everybody's questions.
If I could ask a question, um, I'm wondering about the, uh, you mentioned that you were chagrined by the fact that the Polish government had not approached the British government about declassifying more of their documents that might relate to Kathing. And um, why might that be the case? Why might, be, is, it, is, it, is it just- If I knew that, I could probably okay. buy a winning lottery ticket yeah, yeah, for $570 yeah. million. Is it, I suppose there's the question of diplomatic relations and there's too many other talking points on the uh, table. I think that honestly speaking, I don't think that they um, really believe that there are any documents in the, Britain. The, the Polish the, I, okay. They, they believe what is, the government is believes what people have told them. Um, for example, I mentioned Hanslow Park. How many of you in this room know Hanslow Park? Okay, I'm hitting a zero. Um, Hanslow Park is located near Bletchley Park. Hanslow Park is her government's communication center. It is a gray blur on the Google map with uh, you know antennas if you go there, but you're probably a mile and a half away. However, Hansel Park also contains a secret archive that nobody knew about, which reaches back to the first Crimean War of documents that have not been declassified. Knowledge about it came out during a trial of the Mau Mau's, former Mau Mau's who had uh, sued the British government, and their files were all missing. And suddenly in one folder, an archivist had left a note that these files have been moved to Hanslow Park. So they came to the judge and said, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, could you tell us about Hanslow Park? Oh, that's just the communication center. And the judge said, well, and he brought in the head of whatever appropriate entity, and he admitted that there was a secret archive there. And a ruling was made by the judge to open up the Mau Mau to locate those materials. And then it's a million, 200,000 files, not pages, files. So um, there's a professor I believe he said Cambridge. So what you do is you write to the National Archives, you present your request, they pass it on to this professor. If he deems it appropriately significant, then they goes back to them. So I go through the process and he's agreed. Now I get a letter back from Hanslow Park and it says, well, your request uh, is going to be too expensive to be able to proceed, you know, because it wouldn't mean to expand. Well, we, we only spent up to, I believe it was 660 pounds. I said, fine, tell me where I send the check, wire transfer, whatever you want. No, 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 we don't accept money. Okay, well, how do we do this? Um, well, you can request information from 1940 to 1950, like one decade worth. I said, but I'm not interested in 1940 to 42. I'm interested, let's say, 43 to 52. And I do breakdowns that way. And I said, okay. And so then I had to split it up. One request for Gilder, one request for Strubin, and one request for Stevenson. And for that time period. And another six months passes. And I still have the email with the photos attached. I received a letter explaining to me that yes, we located folders and there are folders labeled Stevenson, Gilder, Strubent, but unfortunately they are empty. <laughs> so my question is, how do archives create and keep empty folders? So those folders, the files from those folders are either in other folders uh, misfiled or intentionally relocated? No. Okay. I'm going to have to, uh, shall we say, attack MI9 uh, and see what I can get there. And I've been waiting for three years because remember when I said that the persons who worked on prepping the Madden Committee, mm -hmm. if you read the Madden Committee hearings, which unfortunately the 
Cole for, insist on referring it to as the report. No, it's not a 2,544 page report. The report is that big and it's in December of 52. This is the testimony in front of the MAC committee. Um, you will see the, that future Congressman Puczynski, Roman Puczynski is referred to as being the investigator for the committee. He is not an investigator. Um, there's a book um, being published about him and his mother, and I believe it was Pula and another gentleman who were working on the sections about Puczynski, and they were presenting someplace. It was video, and I asked them, I said, did you find any documentary proof that Puczynski was, in fact, an investigator? And they said, absolutely not. Um, that was gifted to him so that he would have something to run his political campaigns on. The real investigators were Blitzlane and Mitchell. And Mitchell met with the CIA. And I'm still waiting, three years and counting. I asked them if I could pass it on to somebody in my will, you know, in case the documents show up sure. after I drop dead. You know, you have to make these plans as you start to get gray haired. Uh, but. To, um. I have more questions here. Um, this, as was already mentioned, incredible detective work and your um, uh, determination to track down these uh, uh, pieces of information and put them together into stories is amazing. Um, as an investigator, I can imagine that one of your uh, skills is to get a sense of for what might be out there and in all of these missing files yet or in these undiscovered archives or these undeclassified archives, what is your hope to find? What would be your, what would you like to find? What types of information do you think might be out there on paper? What would you dream of finding if you- um, I'd like to, to find the um, exit interviews, mm -hmm. which were conducted with Stevens and Gilder and Struband, not just their reports, okay. but the actual exit interviews before they get prettied up as, an ex as a report. Um, Gilder's widow sent me material that he had written, as they say in Polish, the Shuflade, way later when he had moved to South Africa. And um, I don't know if there's any other material on that. Um, I really, really, more than every anything, want to find the working papers of the Madden Committee. Mm -hmm. What they have in Washington is perhaps a tenth of what they should have. Um, a great amount of material is lying and desiccating in the attic of Roman Kuczynski's daughter's house, mm -hmm. uh, including recordings of the testimony to the Madden Committee. She will not give anybody access to it. And Pula said that uh, she never invited them to her house and uh, that she is very careful about protecting the legacy of her father. So if there would be some way that somebody could speak to her from the Polish government and, you know, promise her a nice order, maybe she would consider releasing that material because those tapes are probably... Yeah, for the, the sound quality is... I, she brought, when I was in Milwaukee, and there was a dinner and she was coming to that dinner, she brought a shoebox, a plastic box that size of stuff. And she said, oh, there's nothing here I think that would interest me. And I was like, <laughs> and as I went through it, you know, palpitating. Hmm. Um, wow. So... Yeah, that, that answer, yes. Nice, nice, wonderful. Yes, other questions? Yes, question right here, please. Would like to ask a simple question, which is when exactly did you were the victim for the beginning? Like, how many years? 2009. Yes. Uh, Professor Janusz Cisek was head of the Museum of the Polish Army. And he said to me, oh, you know, Pani Krystyno, przyjeżdżają tutaj Amerykanie and uh, we don't have anything for them. So maybe you can have, make a little harmonika. Uh, 
like an eight and a half by 17 inch piece of paper folded up in three and uh, discuss the American officers who went to a press conference in Katy. I said, sure, no problem. Came back about two months later and said, okay, we have a problem. Um, they weren't all American. They weren't all officers. They weren't all military. And they didn't go for a press conference. And in fact, they didn't go there voluntarily. Oh, what would you like me to do? He said, continue. Little did he know what he was starting in 2009. And 14 year and counting um, investigative project. We hope to be the end. Um, I don't want to say product, um, for lack of better words. What the end result of all of this? What are you hoping to finally I, have? I think on the one in terms of a narrative and a full, full blown story, or the goal of it. I think if um, we think of people having a, a moralne krengosu moralne, um, it would be my hope that Americans would look at the decision-making process of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, would understand that the United States was not a total hero, that he made very pragmatic choices for the United States, willing to sacrifice Central and Eastern Europe, so that fewer Americans died and nothing else counted. And I think the Katyn massacre can serve that purpose. I think today talking about it, when people say they can't look at photographs of Bucha or Irkin or other places, I'm sort of saying, well, you know, if you had bothered reading about the Katyn massacre, you'd be familiar with the <laughs> photographs. Um, when we hear about Ukrainian children being kidnapped, then part of what they did when they arrested uh, or seized these men who became prisoners of an undeclared war and later victims of a, of a massacre, they allowed them to correspond with their families and they had the addresses of their families. And so then at an appropriate moment, they could come in and seize those who lived in the ter territories occupied by the Soviet Union during that period of time when they were allied with the Germans. I met a man from New Zealand. Uh, the father obviously was gone because he was in the army. Um, he was a toddler, maybe four years old. Um, so he was with his mother. His brother was 15. They got sent off to Pavlodarsk, which is one of the classic places where Poles were sent off to. And then suddenly the Soviets decided, ah, no, he's an adult. He can go work as a lumberjack. And so the toddler is left with his mother. His mother dies. He's put into a Donjetska, an orphanage. And what they did in those orphanages is exactly what they're doing with Ukrainian children now. They try to eliminate all of their knowledge and identity of themselves as being Polish. And so when Operation Barbarossa started and the British forced on the Russians an agreement that they would allow a Polish army in Russia to be formed, uh, General Anders had Mężowie um, Zaufania, uh, delegates, as they were often referred to. One of them was Hanka Ordonovna. And when they arrived at uh, a famous actress, uh, performer, when they arrived at a Domjetska and they would approach little Ivan, because he would say, oh, I'm Ivan, I'm Ivan. And they'd say, oh, Ivan, do you know about God? Do you know any prayers? And he'd start out like a four-year-old would say, hail Mary, full of grace. And, but it was there. And it was in Polish. And those, well, that was how those little kids were rescued. And that was how that man was rescued. He didn't know his last name. He doesn't. 
He didn't know what Baruch he came from. He knew nothing about himself. The thing that identified him was being able to say a prayer in Polish. And uh, yes, hopefully allowing people to read and learn and understand. It's incredible how um, even in my, in my physical neighborhood where I live in New Jersey, just to speak to lay Americans <clears throat> about a lot of these incidents from World War II, thereafter, and even today in Ukraine, it's like it's completely beyond their comprehension. They, they sometimes they look at me and like, you know, we've seen too many movies. You know, it's like almost like fiction to them. And it's you know, it, it's it's mind-boggling how how the public just can't accept these realities. So and your your kind of work um and, and your peers, I guess worldwide, is is very valuable to, to society. And I commend that tremendously. Thank you. Thank you. It's 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 tireless work and I know it's a very big sacrifice, but it's important to Thank you. Yeah, they are almost fantastic realities. And I recall from a, um, perhaps it was one of your uh, earlier slides, or maybe it was one of your pieces. Um, I recall uh, that the Germans themselves were shocked at the uh, amount of bodies that they were uncovering because they had initially heard that there were only. They thought that they thought it was a much smaller number. number. Then, then they got confused because when they dug up the first pit, which was like the largest pit, and also went down about eleven layers, they calculated the number of bodies there and knew that there were several other pits right, that right, also yeah. contained bodies, and that's where that figure of ten thousand that later appears in the Nuremberg Tribunal started coming from, and so. For those who aren't that familiar with Kadin, Kadin is a generic name for a series of massacres that took place at various sites, one of which was near Kiev, and uh, one of which was near Kain, and then that one which took place near Smolensk in Kadin. And then there's another site which took, uh, which another portion of the massacre, which took place in Belarus, where um, Bachka Lukashenko has announced that he would allow the Poles to exhume the bodies if they could prove that these were genetically Belarusians. Uh, gee, well, in order to prove that, we've got to have access to the body to be able to conduct genetic tests. But you're not going to give us access because we can't prove it. Gee, that's called a catch-22. Yeah, certainly. But to speak to the question of the fantastic reality, it does sound like something that would come out of a work of political fiction or something like that. And uh, I think that's what you're speaking to here, that the Madden Commission itself was, in a sense, um, not only uh, uncomfortable with the paper trail that they had access to on the American side, but just, in a sense, uh, really unable to deal with something of this magnitude and present it in a, um, I guess, a narrative way or a documentary way or a, um, an informational way to the American public. And they also had a problem relating to General Bissell when he was testifying, well, that's just 25,000 people or whatever. There's, I've got camps in Germany where millions have been killed. And, and, and what do I do with that? And and those are the problems yeah. I was dealing with this time. This was just a you know little piece right, right, yeah. of yeah. nothing. Yeah, the entire theater. And World and so for aspect. them, I think that created a I problem see. in how right, they related yeah. to yeah. Bissell, right. because after the, the hearings, they actually and Bissell was already retired, so it was very difficult to do. They were going to try to have him demoted, uh, brought up on charges, and take away his pension. And what ended up happening was. He got a letter to file that he hadn't ex expressed appropriate care and custody of the documents that, that were in his care or right. chain of um, uh, custody. That's Correct. It. Okay. okay. Wow. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, if there are no further questions, Christina is here with us. And we can... Thank you. Uh, no, online we have no questions. No, I don't see any questions online. So, unless I'm says no open questions. Um, but yeah, no questions online. Uh, thank you so much. And Kristen is here. If folks would like to visit, ask personal yeah. questions. I have a couple of students who have been reading um, some of my speeches in my uh, uh, advanced oldest class, focusing uh, on this documentary style. The, uh, uh, the one from 49 or the one from three, the three world. No, it's not pre war, but it's, yes, I think it's what it's called. Uh, oh, is it the Vijayan that was the option? No, 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 no. It's the one about the war starting in people crossing over the border areas around. Yeah, that's right.